it is time to welcome our keynote presenter today, uh, William Connolly. William Connolly is the Krieger Eisenhower Professor of, at Johns Hopkins University, where he teaches political theory. His recent books include Why I'm Not a Secularist, Pluralism, Capitalism and Christianity, American Style, A World of Becoming. He is a former editor of Political Theory, one of the founders of the journal Theory and Event, and a co-moderator of the blog The Contemporary Condition. His early book, The Terms of Political Discourse, won the Lippincott Award in 1999 for a book that is still recognized as a work of exceptional quality at least uh, 15 years after its publication. His new book, The Fragility of Things, Self-Organizing Process, Neoliberal Fantasies, Democratic Activism, <coughs> will appear with Duke in August of this year. Thank you very much, Professor Connolly, for being here. And the floor is yours. themselves, but they also present several family resemblances, uh, affinities and resemblances that uh, place most of their supporters somewhere on the left, while they contest simultaneously some uh, features of neo-Kantianism, exclusive humanism, neoliberalism, and, and uh, classical Marxism. So what are some of the affinities? Uh, <coughs> And I have a button here. Uh, there they are. Uh, so first, uh, classical ontologies of mind, body, idea, matter, and self-worth dualism are challenged with what might be called a protean monism, focusing how life and mind evolve out of non-life. Uh, parts of non-life in this reading already contain uh, traces of perceptual power sensitivity, and agency, typically reserved by many theorists to higher animals 
and to the human estate, at least in Euro-American thought. Second, notions of matter as inert or, or secondary to the form imposed upon them, upon it, are thus replaced by a model in which there is vitality installed in energy matter complexes from the start. Not Elaine Elan Vital or divinely installed vitalism, but energy matter complexes. Third, the, the idea that the uh, human sciences uh, should be post-metaphysical is scrapped. It never worked anyway. What replaces it, or what challenges it, is a metaphysic and even a cosmology that emphasizes the dynamic, temporal, and process character of interacting open systems and things. One which appreciates both periods of real stability being in relative equilibrium in this or that zone, while coming to terms with alternating periods of disequilibrium becoming and new consolidations. We realize that it is uh, difficult to establish such a process metaphysic with certainty, hence the name speculative realism adopted by many of its adherents. Starting with Whitehead. But we also find it essential to bring such a counter cosmology into play in concrete explorations of ethics, state and global politics, uh, and uh, conceptions of democracy, acknowledging the contestable character of this perspective as we proceed. As we go along, we thereby show the contestable character of the cosmologies and ontologies that other theories build more tacitly, often, into their work. Fourth, uh, neither the tendency to erase the human subject, nor to restrict it entirely to human beings and or God is accepted, neither nor. Several participants treat the subject as a real formation that is not the eternal ground of things. We then discern variable degrees of subjectivity and agency well beyond the human estate. We had, a, we had a paper on that this afternoon about animal rebellion. We, uh, we invite and respond to the charge, to the expected charge of anthropomorphism, projecting onto others what only human beings possess. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, uh, we expect that, uh, but one of us, and, 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 and we respond to it from both traditions of theism and exclusive humanism, both of them. They're more complementary to each other than they realize. Uh, uh, we resist, uh, that is, uh, in doing so, we resist anthropocentrism. We resist anthropocentrism, excuse me, as one of the central dangers of our time, with the disposition to anthropocentrism being invested in several orientations to cultural life, cultural theory, biology, and the human sciences. This doesn't mean that we don't care for the human estate or the human species, uh, but merely that we think that the anthropocentric ways of expressing that care have become self-destructive. If, as we confirm the human subject as a formation and erase it as a ground, and as we detect more vitality and capacity for metamorphosis in surprise in a variety of non-human force fields, we also challenge a variety of command and contract conceptions of morality. We do so with an ethic of cultivation grounded in the very contingency of care for this world. Such an ethic then pursues situational judgments about how to define, uh, enlarge, and enact that care in a world in which surprising changes and events periodically emerge. Sixth, as we come to terms with the cosmos composed of interacting force fields invested with different speeds and degrees of agency, 
we must thereby resist the very idea of the sufficiency of cultural internalism in any of the human sciences, or in literature, or in philosophy. Uh, each, of, each of these uh, zones needs to have both a more microscopic and more planetary dimension <laughs> folded into it, with the relevant focus shifting depending on the complex uh, of the, the problem complex under review or scrutiny. Of course, you don't move up and down all of these scales uh, all the time. That would prevent, present a kind of holistic philosophy of totality resisted here. You adopt a problem orientation to politics and political inquiry, pursuing the contours of an issue up and down these interacting scales as the issue requires. In this respect, the new materialism, which I put in quotes, so you'll see why in a minute, the new materialism invites new engagements with classical pragmatism, as Whitehead and Deleuze both already saw. Both of them had a great respect for William James and John Dewey. Um, seventh, proceeding along the lines uh, above, we introduce an element of speculation into the matrix, and we pursue living experiments uh, to test the speculations. Uh, so now the theoretical tasks of cognizing and knowing give some ground to uh, corollary processes of inventing new concepts and acting in, uh, in, in uncertain situations uh, uh, democratically into the future, into, situa into a situation that is played with some degree of real uncertainty. Eighth, these points also encourage us to identify shifting elements of, uh, of real uncertainty and real conditioned creativity in the intersections between several forces in the world. There's typically an ebb and flow in most domains as an open system goes through a period of relative equilibrium followed by another of radical disequilibrium. The latter engenders the moment of the event. A philosophy of becoming, though some fools do, protect, do project such a view upon it, does not postulate a world in which everything is always in radical flux. That would not mean that you could never even act upon one desire before it was replaced by another. Such a misrepresentation may be grounded in a certain anxiety about the challenge that this kind of orientation presents. Ninth, the above explorations encourage us to supplement current conceptions of reasoning and knowing uh, with techno-aesthetic uh, techno tactics by which participants in politics and in the human sciences work to extend our perceptual sensitivities and prime ourselves periodically to participate in the creative element by which new concepts, ideas, themes, tactics, judgments, uh, strategies, and ideals are periodically brought into being. There's more to thinking than judgment and knowing, though those are also part of it. This appreciation of creative thinking and political invention, uh, intervention into all unfolding moments also forms part of the process by which we try to uh, modify or stretch the professional enclosures habitually insulating the human sciences. Tenth, tenth. many of us uh, feel compelled for all these reasons to add a planetary dimension to the study of local, interstate, regional, and global politics, and to add it to political activism as well, as we work upon uh, the received practices of social science professionalism and the notions of uh, explanation and ethics attached to them. All right, that's a long list, but uh, it's my story and I'm sticking with it. Uh, so uh, uh, this, this uh, very cursory uh, discussion really uh, uh, inflects the, com the composite in a, in a particular way. Uh, to me, 
the most uh, unfortunate terms through which to represent such a general agenda <coughs> today are those of post-humanism and anti-humanism. I grasp, I think, the motivation behind those terms. Exclusive humanism, secularism, omnipotent notions of divinity, and scientism have together fostered uh, cramped visions of culture of, and of its implications with a variety of non-human processes. But, uh, but many of us share these critiques of humanism and cultural internalism while seem to emphasize or even drama dramatize care for the fragile place of the human estate and its multiple entanglements with non-human processes. I hesitate a little, too, over the phrase, the new materialism. That's why it was in quotes, uh, even though I think that is the phrase that has uh, come into uh, uh, the, the most uh, is the most active uh, uh, summary or title for this kind of thing. And I even have a very close friend, uh, a very close friend, who uses that uh, title. I don't think that it's very, that we're very uh, apt to be able to relieve all of the uh, <coughs> connotations that have surrounded the words matter over several centuries. Theology, philosophy, cultural life, and so I seek other, other places. So now I would like to put some of these themes into play by drawing from the book that I'm on, or working on. Uh, it's called uh, The Fragility of Things. And The Fragility of Things seeks to appreciate periodic moments of real creativity in three domains. Uh, in cultural processes, in non-human force fields with various degrees or variable degrees of self-organizational power, and in a set of micro, macro culture nature implications. When such a perspective is joined to an account of the intensification, acceleration, and globalization of neoliberal capitalism, we are brought face to face with the fragility of things today. That is, with the growing tensions between the demands neoliberalism makes on both human life and non-human force fields, and the boomerang effects and the suffering and the boomerang effects that emerge as these demands and case of market escalate together. Appreciation of the fragility of things requires cultivation of greater sensitivity to multiple ways in which institutionalized role definitions and active non-human processes intersect. The cultivation of, sense, of such sensitivities, however, is often, or traditionally in political theory, at least, linked to a cautious politics of modest or conservative change. Indeed, sensitivity to non-human processes, such as the musical capacities of whales, or the delicacy of soil processes of, of self-renewal, uh, or the self-organizational tendencies of the ocean conveyor system, uh, it is often linked to a, uh, a, an image of a holistic world. But I break that. This, this perspective breaks with that combination. Uh, it follows a different course. The intuition is that we must simu simultaneously slow down at key moments to enhance our powers of perception, our awareness of, of plural potential incipiencies that are on the way and, and to curtail our pressure on, uh, on a variety of non-human systems as we speed up a series of changes in contemporary role definitions, identities, institutions, economic priorities, and political activism. Doing so by escalating the intensity of democratic activism on multiple sites. But what's more is that the uh, suggestion is that this unruly combination does not merely testify to tensions in my theory, or of the theory of the two or three people who agree with me uh, in this respect. <laughs> Rather, it expresses a real torsion folded into the contemporary condition itself. 
if you ignore any of these dimensions in, in tension, they are in tension with each other, the differential distribution of real creativity in the cosmos, the acceleration of pace in several domains of contemporary life, the dangerous hegemony of neoliberal capitalism, the fragility of things, the need for rapid shifts in role definition and in institutional life, and the escalation of uh, democratic militants on several fronts, you deny some, something essential to our engagement with the contemporary condition, or so the play goes. Let's to, and as I said before, that's my story. Let's turn then to the politics of the event. Uh, so, the rebellions in Eastern Europe, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the rapid rebirth of neoliberal capitalism in Eastern Europe, Tiananmen Square, the birth and expansion of gay rights movements in the United States in Europe, the rather rapid formation of an evangelical capital neoliberal resonance machine in the United States. Nobody expected it. The claim to a right of doctor-assisted suicide in a world in which many neo-Kantians had thought the list of human rights was, was either complete or implicit. The nearly worldwide uh, economic meltdown in 2008, spurred by bank adventurism, mortgage bundling, and derivatives in the US. The popular uprisings in Tunisia and Egypt. The earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear crisis in Japan. The mass event of a slut walk invented by women in the States after a Boston cop advised them how to dress to avoid rape. The eruption of the Occupy movement the student strikes against tuition hikes in Canada and England. These are very diverse moments. I want to list them together because they, I just want to. Uh, <laughs> uh, each of these diverse moments, the bodies, though surely to differing degrees, some of the characteristics of an event. It happens rather rapidly. It throws some regular institutions uh, uh, expectations and rule definitions into variable degrees of turmoil. Uh, its antecedents often seem insufficient to explain its emergence and amplification. Its settlement, when underway, is uncertain, and it makes a real difference in the world, for good or ill. Each time an event erupts, many initially outside its compass are moved to intervene or join it in attempts to support it or to redirect it, or to squelch it. An event starts out of apparent uncertainty, and at least for a while, foments a wider band of uncertainties as it morphs. Events emit contagious and infectious energies. Sometimes democracy or dictatorship hangs in the balance, or the creation of a new right, faith, identity, economic direction, or strategy, or a new fascist movement. Events startle, provoke, and energize. They can also disturb, defeat, alienate, overwhelm, and sometimes incite resentment against the very character of the cosmos. That has political implications, too. They form part of the essence of politics. Another upshot is how events typically throw intelligence experts, media representatives, electoral politics, and conventional practitioners of the human sciences into uh, intense bouts of self-doubt, usually only for a couple of weeks. How did they, we not anticipate this, asked the intelligence agencies. How come we did not predict this, whisper political scientists to each other, before they catch themselves enough to recall how they only promise to predict hypothetical events under conditions in which the variables are closely specified, not to explain actual events in the messy ongoing actualities of triggering forces, contagious actions, complex and floating conflicts, creative responses, obscure searches, ambiguous anxieties, and shifting hopes. Each uh, unexpected event, in fact, creates a brief, a brief flurry of discussion 
in, in the human sciences between those who think that politics can be comprehended in the classic categories of explanation, those who wish they could believe that, but actually can't believe it, those who adopt qualitative or interpretive approaches, and those perhaps becoming prominent again, who think that attention to the event carries you into territory that may, be, may not be entirely reducible to any of these perspectives. These conversations occur between and within us when an event occurs. The collapse of the Soviet Union uh, uh, triggered it again in IR. The emergence of gay rights and doctor-assisted the suicide claims to rights triggered it among some neo-Kantians who started to wonder whether new rights are always implicit in established principles. The consolidation of the Khomeini regime in Iran after the 79 revolution compelled Foucault and Foucaultians to become more attentive to the uncertainty and risk of the event. I think it transformed. And so on. So let me cut to the chase. Uh, the contention is that we periodically uh, live into futures replete with elements of real turmoil and uncertainty. Not merely epistemic uncertainty, which also occurs sometimes, but real uncertainty. Even more, those, sometimes, those uh, strategic moments sometimes secrete a degree of real creativity, for better or worse. Real creativity in the sense of a novel response to conditions from the past that engenders a new result, less than chance and more than simple determination. Uh, perhaps vague frustrations and volatile energies were in the air the day before Mohammed Bouazizi immolated himself in Tunisia. Too intense to be unimportant, too vague, cloudy, and volatile in themselves to be defined. Did that sad event, in turn, help to trigger a political contagion and collective mode of, of creative self-organization that exceeded the power of the trigger? The reassuring faith that our inability to sufficiently explain an event such as that, uh, is, that, it's, that this is due to an epistemic screen shielding us from solid factors, in principle reducible to full determination, is not in itself non-ontological or even non-cosmological. It, in fact, expresses an ontology that needs to be contested much more uh, closely and severe, uh, severely. Perhaps the re rebellion arose out of creative reverberations. I won't use that word. <laughs> reverberations back and forth between a series of singular acts and, and collected predispositions that were initially cloudy in themselves. Perhaps it became consolidated out of that cloudiness through modes of self-amplification and teleo-searching processes that both exceeded the triggering moment and contracted initial vague intensities into something that did not pre-exist the event. Perhaps the event uh, was, uh, was preceded by uh, the cloudy incipiencies laden with real Plural potentiality, incipiencies on the way, laden with plural potentiality. If you contend that the world is periodically punctuated by bouts of metamorphosis and real creativity, you become more alert to just how much weight has been imposed on the idea of the implicit and main, in mainstream of philosophy. You, you become perhaps more attracted to the protean idea of the incipient or of incipients, in which during a period of disequilibrium, a set of plural potentialities on the way become consolidated into a specific actuality, sometimes by teleodynamic processes. Perhaps it is timely today, then, to draw selective sustenance from contemporary work in complexity theory, in neuroscience, in biology, in geology, in critical philosophy, some of whom uh, attribute periodic criticality, teleodynamism, autopoiesis, and real creativity to a variety of non-human processes. Again, we do not uh, expect the interacting open systems in which we participate. Uh, we do expect the, the, those systems to go through periods of relative stability. 
uh, a democracy persists, a neoliberal regime prevails, a new movement becomes consolidated, a global order sta stabilizes for decades, an institutionalized reform becomes embedded. But such uh, consolidations can also be punctuated at strategic moments by surprising accelerations and accentuated instabilities. Such an acceleration might be touched when one open system is touched or battered by another very heterogeneous system, very different from it, uh, with which it is entangled. Uh, so I would like to uh, cherry over this issue for just a couple of moments uh, so that I can try to convince you, I won't, but try to convince you that if you value real creativity in, uh, in human life and culture, you need to come to terms with it in non human processes. So uh, I, will, uh, I will proceed by impersonating a lobster, uh, using the pinchers movement to squeeze upon the skepticism from two directions, a squeeze point. The first claw clamps down by listing a few putative instances in cultural life in which it is difficult to deny real creativity. Uh, many cultural fields will agree with that in advance. The second pincher or claw clamps up by reviewing speculation and evidence about burial degrees of real creativity in a variety of self-organizing, non-human that inter -insect, I'm sorry, intersect at strategic points with contemporary capitalism. Some people quiver and shake at that point. Some of my previous allies don't go for this. The, the first printer, I'll be brief on them. Do you believe, as, as I suspect you do, that moments of real creativity emerge in the plastic arts, in jazz, in rock music, in film, in literature, even in philosophy? If you yourself, indeed, periodically found a new thought or idea coming to you, as if from nowhere, when you were walking, or taking a shower, or immersed in a conversation, or going for a long, slow run. If not, or if you think these are merely epistemic moments of apparent creativity, rather than moments of real, onto creativity, our discussion is probably over for today. If so, is it not likely that, it, that such movements of real creativity also find variable degrees of expression in political events, in changes, in, in real changes in ethical judgment, uh, in, in the explosion of new social movements and in regime formation? So, I'm, I'm cutting out a few things here because I want to move to the second picture. So that is, that is one uh, uh, picture uh, squeezing down. Let's turn, the, turn to the other, squeezing up upon cultural theory from critical work in philosophy and some of the natural sciences. Let's see. Perhaps as uh, William James, Alfred North Whitehead, Henri Bergson, Friedrich Nietzsche, Gilles Deleuze, and now complexity theorists, scientists, such as Stuart Kaufman, Ilya Prigogine, Lynn Margulis, Dorian Sagan, and Terence Deacon think in their different ways, there are also moments of critical, periodic moments of criticality in species evolution, hurricane formation, climate change, geological processes, ocean current shifts, and so on, that convey variable degrees of real uh, uncertainty and self-organizational capacity. Indeed, Whitehead, Margulis, Margulis, and Huffman suspect that real creativity would not have evolved into the human state unless it found variable degrees of expression in some other organic and inorganic processes as well. Moreover, when you dramatize the politics of the event uh, in human life, uh, in dissonant relation to dis disruptive events in non-human force fields, the case for the contemporary fragility of things comes even more sharply in, into view. So we thus move more hesitantly yet into Non-human eventualization. Non-human eventualization. Uh, 
If you place into conversation Alfred North Whitehead, the philosopher who transmuted the early findings of quantum theory into a bumpy cosmology of creative uh, becoming, with Lynn Margulis and Stuart Kaufman, the complexity theorists in biology, the following thesis may emerge. We participate as minor players in a cosmos composed of heterogeneous interacting force fields moving at different speeds. Many of these force fields pass through long period, a long or short periods of, meta, of relative equilibrium, as in the stability of a climate pattern, species stability, solar system stability, and the persistence of an amoeba. Creative cosmic events often occur not within a force field alone, but through a periodic acceleration of reverberations back and forth between heterogeneous interdependent fields. This is true of moments of creativity within the human state as well. So cre the creative element of human freedom is thus not the, simply the property of a masterful agent. Creativity flows through and between us rather than being reducible to a property of agents, a finding that may throw a wrench into traditions of both negative and positive. In the distributed ontocosmology of Whitehead, Time as process is itself eternal, with the creative element varying in scope across types of field. He denies that uh, either that there's no real creativity anywhere, or that creativity is monopolized by a single God. Indeed, a single God. Indeed, he thinks these two traditions complement each other more than they oppose each other. And creativity is deemed, indeed, a strange locution, first introduced, I think, by Whitehead. It is a primitive term in his speculative system. It means that creation is neither ex nihilo nor the simple product of an agent. Here are some elements in conditioned creativity as I, as I distill them from a synthesis of my three figures. No stable set of factors from the past suffices to determine the event. As a new ingression enters one system from another, an old pre-adaptation uh, in the latter, either redundant up to now or given other uses, is redeployed through the acceleration of self-organization within the receiving system. And then see, something new is brought into the world by the accelerated exploratory reverberations between uh, partially open systems. In complex cases, Something like a teleo searching process is set into play. Uh, and so, an open world of becoming thus houses teleological processes, but it doesn't house finalism. And so, those of us who were worried for decades about teleology, maybe we need to separate the idea of teleology from the idea of finalism. Now, perhaps I'll give you a couple of brief uh, punitive examples non-human uh, process. The first example is contemporary controversial. According to biologists, a bacterium needs uh, phosphorus to survive, but in one controversial experiment with bacteria that had already lived in the vicinity of arsenic, experimental infusions of arsenic encouraged the bacteria to evolve so that the arsenic replaced phosphorus, uh, uh, phosphorus to a considerable degree at least as the life giving source. So, from the vantage point of the Whitehead Kaufman marvelous synthesis, this creative development, if true, is complex. It involves first a process of regression, <coughs> that's what it is, in which the arsenic is gradually introduced. Secondly, an evolved uh, feeling uh, by the bacteria of some degree of affinity to it. And third, creative self organization in response to the disruption on the part of the bacteria. In this case, teleosearching process, or what it, what it calls it process, by which it evolves into a new mode of life, an actual entity previously indiscernible on the face of the earth. So this, this creativity is both conditioned and confined so that bacteria not previously surrounded by arsenic not, might not generate this result. So this is a very simple teleosearching process. Uh, installed deeply into the uh, biosphere. 
And of course, this experiment remains at the center of, of controversy. If it does not stand, it does seem to be generally acknowledged by the contestants that the new bacteria are infused with a much higher proportion of arsenic than previous bacteria. The second example eliminates teleodynamism. Well, it, it, well, it illustrates metamorphosis through self-organization, and it carries us even closer uh, to the fragility. If all the glaciers in Greenland melted, the, Earth's, the, Earth's, the, the world's ocean level would rise about 20 feet, creating global habitat. If the same thing happened in Antarctica, it would rise about 200 feet. No one expects either to happen soon. You know at what the usual predictions are between 3 and 7 feet, all, already enough to spawn tendencies to radical migration, wars, and global habitat. But these assessments do not take into account a new factor discovered as recently, oh yeah, as, as recently as 2003, and studied closely even more recently. As warmer water promoted by the long-term interaction between expanding capitalism and climate change moves into the Helheim glaciers in Greenland, it induces enhanced halving events. That is, the release of huge icebergs that hurtle down the fjord, generating intense vibrations that disturb the whale mass. In a cosmos of becoming, the demo often resides in the vibrations. These vibrations, in turn, unleash shallow earthquakes at a faster rate than heretofore. The earthquakes then further destabilize the glaciers, increasing their rate of flow and tendency to spawn new gaps. A dynamic process of mutual amplification across heterogeneous and interacting systems is thus set into motion. The self-amplification circuit, it's in, it's in operation, it's going, uh, is filled with uncertainty at the moment as to how far it will proceed. As the geophysicist Meredith Neville says, quote, now for uh, an individual glacier, it's not clear that they can continue to speed up indefinitely. Will it continue until it has some a catastrophic collapse, or will it stabilize itself at some new equilibrium level? So these are the kinds of questions that a lot of people are working very hard to understand right now. That's the unknown. So this is a, a self-organizing, self-amplifying system that does not seem to have a telium dynamic element, some of the later reports. So that's the pinchers movement uh, that I'm trying to put in play, where more work is needed. You identify instances of plausible creativity and culture, extending them deeply into political processes. You then support those instances by identifying differential degrees of self-organization, metamorphosis, and creativity in non-human processes, in ways that may trouble some cultural theorists who accepted the first move. But why be so troubled? Well, perhaps, but maybe because it's wrong. Maybe because this, there's nothing to this theory. But, but I think it's right. So here's why I think it might be, people might be troubled. It perhaps in part because of the power of the idea of human uniqueness to several humanist and theistic traditions alike. Uh, uh, perhaps in part because such a perspective challenges the determinism of, uh, of, of classical sciences. Perhaps in part because the alternative also challenges the field insulation and professionalism through which cultural theory and the human sciences often tend to define themselves. Because you can't, you can't have cultural internalism. Um, uh, perhaps in part because the alternative calls uh, upon us to fold both more microscopic and more active planetary forces into the human sciences themselves. And perhaps in part because the conjunction of neoliberal capitalism with these non-human force fields today suggests the, the need to radical, radicalize democracy at several sites. Uh, so while well, the next section is called The Fragility of Things, there's a good picture of that, uh, we're moving along here. I think that, uh, uh, I think I've already kind of illustrated, I have about 12 illustrations of the of of things with your 
human estate and its relation to the economy of forces. And uh, they're all great examples. Uh, but I think that I'm going to skip them because I think you've already figured out what they might be. And I would like to close then with uh, toward a multi tier democratic activism. The thesis is that today we must escalate democratic action on several fronts as we slow down and divert the intersections between neoliberal capitalism and a variety of non-human forces. An initial, but only an initial way to get a pre preliminary handle on this difficult situation may be to launch experimental shifts in the roles we now play, both because an accumulation of such shifts can do a certain amount of good on its own, and more because such actions, as they accumulate and spread, may seed the way for a more militant, internal, and cross-country democratic mode of action. Many prescribed roles contain some slack within them. Uh, uh, when you bring the you here is uh, singular or plural, when you bring new themes to your church, you may enliven yourself and activate others. When you alter the style and substance of your teaching of theory or IR, proposing new theories without applying too much pressure to the students to accept them, you rouse yourself and others together. If you encourage your labor union to encompass uh, interstate labor and ecological issues, you again rouse a collective to act upon larger processes. When you change the terms of your consumption to the extent you can afford to do so, investing in uh, In solar panels, buying a hybrid, or telling others why, or joining a slow food movement, or supporting farm to table restaurants, or joining one of the virgin volunteer groups of product repair now springing up, you simultaneously sh strengthen the shaky beliefs that you had prior to those actions, reduce your subliminal implication in the sy systemic tendencies you resist, forge new collective connections, and potentially open yourself yet new ideas and uh, modes of collective action. When you say, start a critical blog with others, you again open up new adventures of collective inspiration, rethinking, and action. And so it goes. Uh, these Such actions, role uh, experimentation, don't accumulate to resolve the issues, but they do make a difference and do not estimate the, un the subterranean affective modes of self-organization that connect identity, faith, belief, role experimentation, pressures on the state, and the formation of cross-country democratic movements. When our role performances are frozen, so are our beliefs, identities, actions, and alliances. When creative shifts in some of these occur, the stage may be set for an amplification system to emerge, because it isn't only non-human processes. Now, I'm, I'm uh, jumping here uh, to get to, to bring us to the end for our discussion. And so, uh, skipping over the discussions of resonances back and forth between uh, role experimentation, larger social movements, new pressures on the state, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, and new alternatives flowing into electoral politics uh, to, to get to the get to the. Suppose that such, uh, such a resonance machine between these different modes of practice is, uh, it, it is, is well underway, and it's met by a new disruptive event or crisis. Such a thing will certainly happen. We don't know what exactly what it will be, but it will happen. Well, the odds may now increase that more people will act in favor of dismantling neoliberalism and radicalizing democracy than forging a neo-fascist response to the shock, because those are two possibilities. Yes, yet at such a moment, some radicals may insist that any reform less than a total revolution will be self-defeating. They articulate a God's eye view of a system that is said to be more tightly interlocked than I think any set of systems is, uh, rather, rather than one of multiple systems of heterogeneous sorts uh, interacting together. So a philosophy of imminent naturalism resists 
simultaneously methodological individualism, tightly structured structural theories, uh, eco and ecological dualism in favor of a thesis of diverse connections between several heterogeneous open systems. It may thus be wise to move back and forth between role experimentation on several fronts, blog activity, reconstituting the human sciences, forging links across different constituencies, uh, uh, exerting new pressures on states, and, and uh, looking for ways to create yet another cross-state citizen movement, because that's the most important thing. So uh, we may need, this is the one I like the least, but you know, back on it, so there it is. We, need a, uh, we may need a beacon to hold before us today as we address the uncertain fragility of things and powerful cultural forces ranged against uh, acknowledging it and responding to it. The we is invitational. The beacon is what Alfred North Whitehead would call a lure, emphasizing its temporal horizon and sensual attraction. To me, a promising lure might be to prepare by all of the means that were merely listed, alluded to, uh, just recently in the paper, large minorities within several constituencies for the day when we can successfully enact together a general strike in several countries simultaneously. Perhaps it could be a graded strike at first, with one-day actions followed by larger period, longer periods. Uh, in fact, and, and perhaps the fact that it is staged simultaneously in several countries would make it more difficult for any country to defeat it entirely. The immediate goal would be to press international organizations, localities, states, corporations, banks, churches, labor unions, and universities to defeat neoliberalism, to curtail climate change, to reduce inequality, and to infuse a, 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 a vibrant uh, spirituality back into <coughs> democratic machines that have lost so much of their vitality. So that's my interim report. Uh, clearly, a lot of work needs to be done. Uh, and I just call your attention to the contemporary condition uh, in which uh, a group of us, uh, there are about 10 people who write for it regularly, anybody else can submit something, and we invite each and every one of you to submit something uh, to the contemporary condition. It, uh, it has now acquired uh, quite a few readers, and I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Connolly. So I'll open the floor for questions. Um, um, Bill, I want to thank you for this, uh, um, not just the presentation, but the way that you organized the, what is a very broad vision. Uh, and I should tell you that I recognize myself in your story. Uh, and so therefore, I, I don't uh, dispute the story at all. I want to pressure you on a couple of things, but I will only talk once. Maybe we can come back to the second one, it's more political. But the, the one that I would like to hear you think a little more about, it seems to me that there's a certain ease with which the non-human is assumed um, to, to be able to articulate itself. Uh, and uh, I say this not because I don't think there's such a thing as non-human, of course, Oh, there is, but the question, there is an epistemological question, how the non-human uh, has, we may be that the non-human may be able to express itself, but even if it, that, even if that assumption is, we could all agree on, and the translation of this ex exception is always happening, obviously through some sort of human form, right? Uh, you are, um, I, I mean, the lobster uh, cannot, the, lo the, the lobster uh, it may be performing this, this activity that you read and describe, but the lobster is not able to, in fact, theorize this activity and certainly not part of the conversation. So I would like to hear more about that because it seems to me that, although I'm totally with you, of course, I mean, um, I, I'm also wary of the certain traps of anti-humanism, which I'm not saying that you are representing, but 
but but they are always there that we have to overcome. They're just as problematic as exclusive humanism, at least at the point where we are now, I'm trying to articulate something that will go beyond humanism and humanism debate. So for me, this is really, you know, we, the non-human is essential to our argument, but every time we use it, we are in fact the ones who are using it, I mean, humans. And, you know, we are describing it, we are describing it. Um, I mean, this may sound kind of ridiculous, but it, seem, but it seems to be bottom line that I, I haven't been able to get around. So, well, uh, thanks for your question. Uh, and, uh, and, and that is kind of like the central issue for white head, in my judgment. Yeah. And so, uh, so you, you get well. You you have the kind of uh, constitution of the world, of the Newtonian world, and that was a subjective constitution of the world, given all of our experimental tests and available things and so forth. Uh, and uh, and then some surprising things happened that made uh, people start to have some doubts about it, start to worry about it. Uh, at things that were unexpected, and they thought that their subjectivities and categories were, in a, were insufficient to it, maybe. So they started doing some work on themselves. Some of them started reading Spinoza. Some of them did some other things to try to open themselves up. So, uh, and then there's the, the Kantian view, is that, that we, uh, we constitute uh, the world through our categories of understanding, but none of those categories of understanding have held up. They've all broken down. <coughs> And so, and so they're not they're not necessary categories of standing, understanding. They they started to falter. They started to well, and and then and then Kant himself says, you know, uh, I because he's you know really genius. He says, I see now that uh, organisms don't fit into the conception of nature or the conception of humanity. So it's a trifecta, and organisms have these capacities of self-organization, where the part contributes to the whole and the whole contributes to the part. And he says, but we can't understand that. We can't grasp that. So we just have to postulate a God who made it that way. That's just a brief account. And so, and so, uh, <laughs> but but, but we, he, he does leave it aside. He says, we can't do it. But uh, a huge number of complexity theorists in all kinds of fields <coughs> say, yeah, we're, we, we have better concepts now through a variety of excruciating uh, uh, explorations of our sensitivities and expansions of them, and then through tests, and then through the formation of new con concepts, some of them emerge as if from nowhere, from, as a surprise. And so, uh, so you you get guys like Stuart Kaufman and, uh, and Terence Deacon and and uh, and Lynn Margulis who who introduced the concept of symbiogenesis into biology, and all the biologists said no, but they all accepted. Uh, and so, and so, uh, our subjectivity is profoundly involved and involved, but uh, but it has capacities uh, through various surprises and other modes to extend, to stretch, to render itself more sensitive, and then and then uh, and then to engage in experiments. So I don't understand this stuff, but the the, the guys in uh, quantum mechanics say Here, we can uh, now deal with the issue of entanglement. But if you think you understand it, you don't. We could we could do experiments on it and so forth, but we can't we can't explain it. Uh, the issue of, uh, of simultaneous uh, changes across billions of uh, uh, huge distances and so forth. So I I just don't want us to have the I want to keep subjectivity. I just don't want us to have these. Uh, I just don't want us to take the accordion approach to subjectivity. Where you, you broaden it out when you're dealing with these issues, but when it comes to these natural processes and so forth, you act. It's we're just imposing our categories upon it. It couldn't be otherwise. I think that that the history of changes are, 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 are too dramatic here. I think it can. We, th there's a responsive side to subjectivity as well as a constitutive side. That's what I should try to say. Uh, so uh, I think subjectivity is one of the issues here, and I do think. That it is a uh, what should I say? I think it's hubris. Uh, well, you don't do that. You, you, you don't deny subjectivities elsewhere. You just say, well, uh, how are we going to understand them? But we we might to some degree grasp them better, and then we might to to another degree, even when we can't grasp them, we might see that you know the interactions here are very important. The, 
the, the, the, the, the uh, metamorphosis processes by which bacteria uh, switch, uh, and, and, and by which you have, uh, in, 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 on another register, you have bird human flu <coughs> transmissions. When I was a kid, the, the, all the doctors I knew said, no, no that never happened. And uh, so, uh, I think that the, the, the changes have been radical already, and it's good to look back at them and see. So, I I take your point. You will not eliminate the subjectivity of the human being, and we do not know how far it can be stretched and strained and rendered more sensitive. And uh, uh, it ain't going to go that far. I accept all those things, but but I I uh, I think that we. That we live in a world that is uh, that is that is as uh, fragile today as the world of Sophocles was, and that and that uh, that that these uh, that we have to that we need to challenge all of these attempts to kind of deny and, and hide the, the intersections between the human and the non-human as much as we can. Of course, you do it in variety of sources. I know that. Is Okay, um, just to remind everyone that after this, there is the round table where you can, a lot of this can be discussed with all the round table panelists. So I will take for now two questions at a time. There is a question over here. here. Um, thank you very much for that talk. Um, <coughs> I generally agree very much with this non determined uh, ontology of potentiality and taking into account non humans. Um, equally, and I very much like that at the end you ask the question what to do politically. Um, so, and I reformulate that question as how to make a good event politically, whatever that would mean, more plausible. And it was when I got you right about presetting the networks and the constellations in a way that if there is another event, it's more likely that something good comes out in the end. Um, when? Hmm? When there's another one. Yes, <laughs> yeah. when. So, That's why I um, make lists. And um, I have the impression that all the examples you um, made up, like for example starting a blog or a new activist movement and all this stuff, was on a really micro-political level, um, on an individual level. And I'm wondering about what about the institutional level, the macro-political level which is also an important part of politics. So the question is, is it possible to make good political events more likely through a general institutionalized setup on this more macro-political level? And just to do some name dropping, to reformulate that, um, with Bonsier, you could say, is it possible to think um, about the police which makes politics, good politics in Rossi's uh, sense, more possible, or to um, change the empire, speaking with Kartnicki, in a way that it enables multitude. Can I, can I, can I take it? One of the yeah, there's, uh, I'm afraid I'm Well, micropolitics is absolutely essential insufficient. You have to have both, and they need to. And macro politics is very important and radically insufficient. I'd like you to write that down because you've got to have both <laughs> interacting, or you are, or it won't, uh, it won't work. Uh, and uh, I am not, uh, uh, I am not a person on the left who thinks that uh, I, I'm utterly opposed to the nation, but I have an ambivalent approach to the state. I think that the more you try to divest from the state, under the condition in which I live, the more you give. Uh, you give uh, uh, market power uh, outside the state. So, so uh, uh, I, there's no way in which uh, I don't I don't buy uh, Rancière's notion of police. I think it's a very crude category. But but uh, I, I I agree that you have to have both of these things uh, inter intersect and interact. Is that too long? I know what you're doing. Yes. All right. We'll take two at a time. Yes. Yeah. We'll take. Two. So a question yes. here. Thank you very much for this uh, fascinating and uh, talk. Uh, there's one epistemology and epistemology question. There's one for two questions. My question is going to be metaphysical. So, uh, during your, your speech, you use uh, the notion of a system, society in open system, very often. And my question is, what is a system? Is that 
an open system. Is it? Isn't it self-contradictory? No. I would claim that any idea of a closed system is a possible system. Yeah, and, that, and that all systems, to varying degrees, and we don't always under, that are, are inter, uh, locked and inter, uh, uh, collated with a variety of others, so that today we have uh, the, the uh, intercalation of the heterogeneous systems of neoliberal capitalism climate change, which none of the classical Marxist, radical, liberal, blah, 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 blah ever dreamed of, and need, none, of, none of us did either, uh, uh, inter, inter uh, associated with climate change, with uh, ocean currents, with glacier flows, and those are heterogeneous open systems. None of them is intact and incomplete uh, uh, of itself. And so, so the, uh, the Whitehead pushes this by saying, uh, if you understand that all systems are open, you'll re realize that there's elbow room in the, in the universe. Every now and then he turns a good phrase. Most of the time he doesn't. I mean, he's not a good writer, but, 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 but so I don't, think there are, I don't think that there are closed systems. Uh, the event. Um, can, you, can you differentiate uh, an emancipatory event in a, from uh, an ugly event? Well, a lot of times you can. Who asked that question? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, good thing. yeah. <laughs> a lot of times you can, but uh, sometimes you are, and this is the, the problem with uh, all of the uh, contractual theories of ethics and, the, and, and uh, all of those traditions, uh, their, their universalism is too, it is, is too thick. And, uh, and sometimes you find yourself in the middle of a situation that has changed in ways that, that surprise you, surprise the people around you, and you have to think again. You have to think again about how to act, what judgments to introduce, how to proceed. And, and we uh, live in a universe without the kinds of uh, full banisters that people want. But if we don't come to terms with that feature of the universe, in my judgment, we don't come to terms with that feature of the universe, things will be worse rather than better. That's my hunch. That's my guess. So, so sometimes you can differentiate them. Sometimes uh, you can't. I can. You can see how uh, uh, I can be very sympathetic to how uh, Oedipus made a tragic uh, mistake and be sympathetic to the to the situation. But it's a it's a retrospective judgment to some extent. Uh, and uh, and I and I and I, I think the smartest guy in that no that was Antigone, the smartest guy in that play was the was was the uh, messenger who says uh, the uh, there is no reliable hor horoscope for human beings. That is that is on the way to a, uh, a, 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 a an ethic of situationally anchored ethic of care. That's where I'm. Okay, once again, pretty brief. Okay, Professor Tabak, and the question. Uh, I thank you for your presentation. I actually want to ask you a bunch of questions, but I want to talk to you about Hegel in general relations with those things that trouble to my head. But uh, I'm very fascinated by this notion of uh, potentiality. Plural potential. Pardon? Plural potential. Plural potential. Yeah, That's yeah. what I want to get. Yeah. Because you ruled out uh, the finalist version. Yeah. And, um, and I think my question also relates to your question about well, how do we know when we see it? Then, on that. What is it in the human potentiality, so to speak, that makes 
our actions, decisions, sensations, and all these things um, not entirely contingent either. So there is no finalism. And how do you avoid our contingency? Completely? So there's something about human nature, perhaps. Um, maybe even in a sense that uh, we can't be informed this kind of decision and gets us to decide. Gives us a standpoint, a standard with which we can say this is what this is going to be. I have a number of problems with your philosophy, mainly stemming from um, a lot of statements that you made to defend your philosophy that are blatantly pseudoscientific, uh, namely the uh, anecdote that you made about uh, the bacteria that changed from arsenic to, or, sorry, changed from phosphate to arsenic. Uh, that was um, from a journal study from uh, Nature, I believe. It was recalled immediately the data was entirely false. Uh, but, um, so I just, I don't really understand what point you're trying to make in terms of the, the teleologies that you're proposing and, and, and whether things are, like whether the Earth is actually a closed teleological system or whether things are all connected as you've been saying. Because I think that your philosophy hinges heavily on the philosophies of, um, or re really the, the Gaia hypothesis, which was proposed by, you know, scientists that you, um, Reference to Lynn Nordless, uh, Kaufman, uh, Lovelace, and it's pretty much universally hand, so I don't really know what, what point you're trying to make. And you know, you know, so can you defend your philosophy given these things? Thank you. Uh, so uh, let me try to respond to the, uh, to the first. Uh, the, well, yeah, if you have these notions of uh, potentiality, then, then you, 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 uh, you try sometimes to situate yourself uh, uh, in an incipient process while it's on the way, and, then, and, 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 and you try to intuit where it might go, or possible the varieties, but uh, your, the, the degree of certainty that, that many people want, including my friend over here, is not, uh, it is not available. Uh, and so you, you uh, uh, and, and, and one of the ways to respond to that is to kind of create closures uh, to say that it is available. Oh, okay. So, uh, uh, but then it doesn't work out that way. And, and you say, oh, yeah, well, uh, okay, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, ret you know, I'll retire from the Clinton administration and I'll try, uh, and I'll try to become, you know, uh, Larry Summers, I'll try to become a university president somewhere else uh, soon because I was totally mistaken on what was happening. Uh, so, so I want uh, I, I want uh, teleo searching processes, which is what uh, Terence Deacon and many biologists now think do operate uh, in uh, the uh, in 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 the uh, evolutionary process. That, that's their claim. That's the way they're they're making sense of things that the genocentrists have not been able to deal with and have not been able to respond to. How you have a whole series of uh, Changes occurring over a short period of time, so I want I want that, uh, but I think that most of us used to think that when whenever we heard the word teleology, we thought it had to be associated with the finalism. I think that all of the people that I've just been mentioning don't think it has to be associated, with the and they're not associated with the uh, And uh, so. Uh, so I, I kind of like the idea of incipients as plural potentiality better than the implicit. I think that in the human sciences, people have overplayed the implicit. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's just the way I, I'm trying to go on that. Uh, opening up a position between the, the causal, the finalist, uh, that is uh, teleo searching process, uh, and then. Uh, the, the issue about, uh, well, whether it's uh, pseudo-scientific or not, well, uh, uh, I think that uh, people like uh, Kaufman and Margulis and Deacon and others, especially in biology, have been, uh, have been uh, introducing some very interesting uh, things to, ex to come to terms with issues in their fields that people haven't been able to come to terms with. And I think, sure, uh, 
uh, a lot of people reject the Gaia hypothesis. So it's not one that I find myself that drawn to. But uh, my understanding is that uh, symbiogenesis is alive and well. And that, uh, so, so, but it was called pseudoscience when it was first introduced. And then people said, well, you know, there's something going on here that, it, that we have to come to terms with. And so, uh, uh, and the, the uh, uh, I said that the, that the example was a controversial example. Uh, it, it, it hasn't been recalled immediately. What has been done is that a lot of people are doubtful as to whether you can get rid of all of the phosphorus. Uh, I kind of doubt that myself, but that's, I said that in the paper. Uh, so, uh, uh, and uh, I worry that, uh, that you have a hubristic conception of science. I worry about that. Uh, and so I just wanted to mention that. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take the last three questions, which are from Lilia, Andreas, and Avon. Speak up, please. The first question is uh, just out of curiosity what's the relationship between complexity theory and chaos theorists, the early ones? If you could elaborate on that. So the idea is that the wings of a butterfly somewhere might cause a current that leads to a tornado elsewhere, and your example to me seemed to, I mean, that brought that in mind. Um, then the other question is more maybe a concern. Um, I, I'm not sure about whether your uh, claim is uh, reductionist or not, but maybe you can cl clarify that, because it seems to be that politics has to do with different kinds of phenomena, and there's a lot of normative statements involved. Whereas mathematics is more descriptive and explanatory, and applied mathematics is different from pure mathematics, obviously. So just like mixing these language games seems to me to bring some kind of um, ethical concerns that are similar that I find in Badiou's philosophy, that you're trying to explain uh, events that occur in between human interaction through a natural scientific framework. But I'm, I should be maybe a little bit more clear about this, but this is just my, my question. Um, so the one is very brief and the second one is more of a concern. Thank you. Yes, uh, very, two very quick questions. The first is um, I was thinking uh, um, whether uh, capitalism uh, might, might fit into your ontology. In fact, it seems to me that capitalism is a very materialism in the way you define it. It shares all these elements of your ontology. and. Um, it might be bad. Sir. So, if um, uh, one opens oneself to this question, then um, what we, how we understand democracy, might be, and I will use a very unfashionable term, very unnatural. So, democracy will be unnatural uh, with the old and the new uh, materialism, because uh, the, the dimension it has that they are so, in Casoriadi's term, uh, the result of this kind of imagination, like uh, social justice. In, in, in this kind of new ontology, is there any place to locate uh, the decision for social justice, so the decision for equality, uh, or even uh, to do things uh, that may appear to be um, very transgressive uh, from the point of view of, uh, like you mentioned, ethical principles. So uh, in that sense, it would mean, it would seem that uh, democracy uh, in its anti-capitalism might be also uh, independent or separated from this uh, need for a new ontology. And the last question from uh, Thanks. So my question is, um, the way you describe events is that, of course, events are surprising, uh, and every event uh, opens up a potential side of resistance. But of course, you argue that while these events are accidental, they're not wholly accidental. So I imagine you would say that there's multiple sides of agency that exist within them. In a sense, an event happens to us, but we can also kind of move around, right? We can wiggle around in these events. Um, so this brings to mind, of course, the fact that while events may happen, uh, you know, they may open spaces for particular participants, I imagine you want to say that we can bring in others as well, right? So it's not just that they uh, ho happen wholly accidental to a group of people, such that we can actually expand the webs of entanglement to other people, right? Um, so this, of course, brings into mind uh, a question of 
desire and where desire comes into this. So now before, of course, maybe you respond with uh, uh, like an analysis of affect. I wonder perhaps maybe whether affect may be a bit too reactive to automatic here. And I wonder whether, you know, where desire fits in this philosophy and whether you have a philosophy maybe perhaps of seduction. And in what sense seduction really works in here? Because if an event happens to me and others exist on the fold or maybe on the fringes of an event, I imagine how exactly do we explain or do we promote an analysis such that we can bring those others into that uh, event? And this, of course, involves uh, uh, some sort of analysis of desire, and I, it seems to be quite missing from your talk, and I wonder if you could expand on where desire fits into that. Sliding into uh, his his actual work, some Bergsonian themes that may not have been so so easily uh, slide in there. But when you get to people like Kaufman and uh, Deacon and uh, and uh, uh, Murray, it, it fits well. Uh, and so and so you have you have different modes or degrees of self-organization, -organ different modes and, and levels is a better word of self-organization. Uh, and uh, I don't know uh, uh, the uh, uh, your other one was about mixing politics and mathematics. The ones that kind of fascinate me are people who were mathematicians and then decided that you know, that's not quite true. Whitehead was a leading mathematician and logician. He wrote the book with Bertrand Russell. They, and then he, he found, that, found himself going off in, in a very different direction and Russell going off in this direction. Uh, and, and, and I think that that, that kind of, of, of achievement, and then, you're, and then you start to think whether some processes that are real, uh, some processes that are real are actually algorithmic. Uh, that comes into play. It's beyond my my skill level, I, but but uh, I do find what what a person like Whitehead says about logic and mathematics very fascinating because he knows the game, he knows what what's going on, and and he thinks it is limited as to what it can do uh, for the world. Uh, that's all I can do. I'm sorry uh, about that. Let's see. The, 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 uh, the, well. Uh, the, the subtitle of the book is called, it's called Fragility of Things, Self-Organizing Systems, Neoliberal Fantasies, Democratic Activism. Because the, the, the most famous neoliberals uh, thought that markets were self-organizing processes. And, and, and Hayek is one of the most, most brilliant ones. In chapter two is on Hayek. And, uh, but what Hayek did is he did two things. He, he, he talked about self-organizing processes, and then he thought that, uh, that really the only ones that are important are markets. Now, as soon as you say that, you have, uh, uh, you have pulled yourself away from the fragility of things. You've pulled yourself away from the, a variety of other systems that have self-organizing capacities that interact with markets and interact with this Including social movements, He's, he doesn't want social movements. He doesn't want unions. He doesn't want all kinds of things. And so he, he keeps deflating that. And then the second move he makes is that that a self-organizing system uh, has impersonal rationality. So move it to markets, give it to uh, 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 
uh, uh, equate it with uh, impersonal <coughs> rationality as long as the state is very, very active in supporting the process. So it's not a minimal state, it's a very active state in supporting the process. And so I want to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to blow that apart. I want to take it away the equation, and I want to multiply the number of self-organizing systems of various degrees with which the political economy is interacting. Then you have a notion of the fragility. So, uh, and 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 since uh, I'm a Democrat, uh, uh, I, I want to pay attention to a lot of self-organizing activities uh, in democratic politics, and to the and and to the way that they that they emerge as surprises and they they're thrown into the process, and they, that's why I make so many lists. Uh, so, uh, so I I want to I want to say that. Um, that, that this is a this is a kind of a critique of neoliberalism that uh, doesn't uh, share with some other critiques doesn't share all of their uh, characteristics uh, and uh, and then okay I, I think we have another point uh, social justice well what I'm trying to think about in, in, in this book is what I, what kind of an infrastructure of consumption is needed today to enable uh, all sectors, all levels of the society to participate in, it would, that would already start to reduce inequality significantly if you change the in infrastructure of uh, consumption uh, radically. <laughs> and, uh, and what I don't want to do myself is I, I, don't, uh, I want to reduce inequality radically, I want to give reasons for doing so, but uh, I don't want a systematic theory of social justice. I don't think that uh, that's where, uh, in the kind of world that we inhabit, I don't, I, I'm not sure that such a systematic theory is going to get you that much. But the thing that I was talking about the theory, I was talking about the practice. So in, in the way you envision uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, ontological uh, reality, whether uh, social justice fits, yeah. or maybe social justice is only a humanocentric uh, uh, obsession. Yeah, that, uh, that's why I don't call myself an anti-humanist. Because it's not just a humanocentric uh, obsession, uh, and and I think that that those people who've been going that route have overplayed their hand, and and uh, and they haven't come to terms sufficient with the fragility of things. They, you know, the, the most radical ones think that uh, we can uh, uh, we can live eternally, not in our and not in the embodied state that we're in now. I mean, I've heard the guy forgot his name. It, 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 where, uh, where we're just on the threshold of living forever. That's a post humanist view. Um, I like it. I, mean, I, I visualize it with that with an eye. That, that, that I used to watch Alfred Hitchcock. But the, so, uh, so I, uh, I, I think those, that, that those uh, orientations are overplaying their hand and they're not coming to terms with the considerations that might amplify our. Uh, so I don't, I don't use those names. I'm, uh, I'm kind of running out of gas, so I'll, uh, I'll answer this question brief, pretty briefly. Uh, so, so you have you have notions of causality, and then you have notions of accident and chance. And and uh, uh, there are elements of accident and chance in the world, but but once you you start to kind of multiply the different types of causality that are actually operative. Emergent causality and so forth. Uh, you you don't have to you don't have to kind of assume that every uh, every explanation that escapes the sufficiency of efficient causality it must be accident or chance. So you 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 don't just have to limit yourself to those two categories. I mean, I love William James, but he has uh, he tended to do that in a pluralistic universe. He's a philosopher of becoming, and he tended to 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 kind of go that way. Uh, uh, and and so I much prefer uh, Whitehead on this point that, that there are multiple and Bergson there are multiple modes of causality and we're kind of really and 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 every time you multiply uh, change your notion of causality you have also changed your notion of agency and agency and causality start to become intercoded in some of these processes uh, and then uh, what about desire. Seduction, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, that's good. I like seduction. Well, the, the, the <laughs> uh, I, I think that uh, all of the stuff that people have been working on for a couple decades now, about micropolitics in the media and so forth that, 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 that works on the effective register of intersubjective. And then what you mentioned today, tactics of the self, I think all of those things, both of them, they intersect with each other. They're very pertinent to the kind uh, of affective disposition we have towards the world. I think that, that, the, that the evangelical neoliberal resonance machine, which has <coughs> have dominated American politics for 35 years, uh, is uh, it, one, of the, one of the kind of secret things that intersects with them is a certain kind of existential resentment. And, and, uh, and I think that's existential elements enter right into uh, politics and ethics. And, and to try to bracket those out is if they're irrelevant, that's why I'm not a secularist. That if you try to bracket those out, then uh, you're not coming to terms with desire. So I don't have a really good theory of desire, but I do pay attention to affect and I do pay attention to how you try to work on subliminal aspects of desire that are not susceptible to uh, sufficiently to intellectual regulation. I think intellectualism is overplays its hand. But I don't think I've answered the question. I haven't answered any of them, but I... <laughs> well, thank you very much for having me. With the risk of having to seduce you, I will tell you that the final event is by far the best event, which will be a conversation between Professor Connolly, Professor Kalivas, Professor Paul, Gulburis, and Tabak. Um, so please rejoin us in 10 minutes for this final event, the roundtable.